Greg to posterity. Okay. So my name's uh, Ben. I'm a scientist at the University of Chicago. Once a week I get to come down here and talk to people about dinosaurs. It's a pretty good way to spend a weekend. So this is the famous Sioux. This is the largest T-Rex that has ever been discovered. Uh, she was discovered in South Dakota in 1990. Now not only is she the biggest T-Rex ever found, she's also by far the most complete T-Rex ever found. She's over 90% complete by volume. Now, what does that mean? Now, the more complete a skeleton is, obviously, the more you can learn from it. But if you were to find a small trilobite in your backyard, and you told me it was mostly complete, that'd be an extraordinary find. Not, and the bigger your fossil is, the harder it is to find every piece. So this is extraordinary, this is unprecedented. The next biggest, next most complete, is about 60 to 70 percent complete. So we've learned a lot from this animal. Now, T-Rex, who was found in South Dakota, this one, uh, is the all-American dinosaur. Found as far north as Saskatchewan, Canada, to as far south as about New Mexico. Only found in North America, usually Montana, Utah. She was discovered by Sue Hendrickson, a private fossil hunter, it's where Sue gets her name. Now Sue Hendrickson was not a dinosaur hunter. She was most famous for hunting amber, fossilized amber, like little insects. And at the time, about half of the fossilized amber in the world had been discovered by her. That was what her expertise was in. But she was off one night hunting through what's called the Hell Creek Formation, an area that's about 65 to 67 million years old. And what Sue Hendrickson stumbled upon was these little pieces of bone. This is her backbone. These vertebrae sticking out of the bedrock. When you go fossil hunting, you just don't dig and hope you get lucky. You actually have to find pieces exposed sticking out into the air, and you get a very short window before it gets eroded away. So she found these pieces sticking out. She noticed from the shape of the vertebra, oh my god, I think I have a T-Rex. It's one of those amazing things about a science education. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> So here's one thing. It's not like she was memorizing the shape of vertebra and knew exactly how to identify T-Rex vertebra. That's not the way science education works. You don't memorize kinds of animals. But you realize what it's like to be an animal this size. She would have been seven tons when she was alive. That's about the same mass as both African elephants behind you. Two African elephants put together. Now think about that like. You have seven tons on eight legs here. Like columns holding up the Parthenon. Just these giant trunk-like legs, right? Imagine that much mass on two legs on her tiptoes, bent over, right? Imagine the, the girth that she has to hold up, how big these legs need to be. Also, the strain on her back. Imagine you had to lean over all the time, the kind of lower back pain you have on. So she needs a stronger spine to help support this horizontal posture. Well, the worst strain is on her lower back right here. And the weakest part of her backbone is the gap between the vertebrae. So how do you strengthen that weak link? The gaps between the vertebrae, you make them bigger. So you notice her vertebra have these big gaps right here. They get bigger and bigger and bigger as you go back. To the point where they're like big dinner plate sized gaps between the vertebrae. What happens when you have those large gaps? You get a deep U shape underneath the vertebra. So Sue Hendrickson found a deeply curved bottom of the vertebra. That meant you have a large horizontal animal that's about 67 million years old. That means you have a T Rex. Exactly. So it actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you just have to does. think about it for a while, right? This is, and this is the way scientists think. What's it like to be an animal this time? So it took about two weeks to unearth her. Uh, she was brought to uh, the Black Hills Institute, her colleagues there. Now, one of the reasons Sue is so famous, not because she's so big and complete, but also she was subject to quite a bit of controversy. She was claimed by four different groups. The Black Hills Institute that unearthed her, uh, the federal government under mineral mining rights, you can believe that, uh, the Sioux Indian Reservation, which also occupied the land, and the owner of the land, a rancher by the name of Maurice Williams. Now, uh, this ended up being raided by the FBI, years of litigation, so he was stored in a machine shop for several years, eventually given ownership to the landowner, Maurice Williams, and all he cared about was the money, So, which panicked a lot of people. So he put her up for auction in New York. She could go anywhere. She could go some rich guy as a part of their, their new kitchen, or it could have been bought by a museum, which was studied by the public and by scientists. Fortunately, uh, the Field Museum put together some money from a couple of small companies, uh, you may not have heard of, McDonald's and Disney, small, small little players, bought for about $8 million, ultimately about a $20 million investment by the museum, opened here in 2000. It's enough about the, the fossil history, let's talk biology of T-Rex, because I'm a biologist, that's what I'm going to do. So as I mentioned, a seven ton animal. One of the big uh, controversies when I was growing up, a uh, big dinosaur nerd, was is she actually a predator of live animals or was she a scavenger? Was she just so big and unwieldy that she, there's no way she could run down live prey? They probably couldn't stop very well. She's not really a hunter. Uh, she must just be big and scary to scare away other animals and steal their prey. 
Well, we learn a lot from dinosaurs by studying animals that are alive today. And it turns out there's no such thing, or very rarely, as a pure hunter or a pure scavenger. Carnivores will eat whatever they can get, right? So she probably did both, but we now know she definitely was able to hunt live prey. When we, we know that is we found a piece of her tooth embedded in the tail of a hadrosaur dinosaur, and it broke off in the tail, and the tail healed around the tooth. So we know she bit a live animal that escaped and survived that attack. You know it's the same T-Rex? Yes, in fact, T-Rex teeth are very easy to identify. I can talk about them in a bit. So let's learn what kind of a predator she would have been. And we learn a lot by looking at her skull. We know she would have an excellent sense of smell, better vision than us, very much like Hawkeye vision. You can see very long distances, binocular vision, so she can track animals, break camouflage, judge their distance. The biggest known brain of any dinosaur, that doesn't necessarily mean she's the most intelligent. She's a big animal. Big animals have big brains. But she wasn't dumb. It's very consistent with a, with a predator that's hunting live animals. But her skull is very unusual for a dinosaur of her type. She has an unusually big and boxy skull. Very thick jaws. And you can learn by taking a look at one of her teeth. So come on in here. Is this a real teeth? This is a copy of one of her teeth. <laughs> so it's a real teeth. Uh, no, it's fake teeth. It's, it's one of uh, Sue's teeth that would have been an upper left maybe in that gap right there. What's amazing about this tooth, the size of a giant banana, is only about that much sticks out. About two thirds of it is root. So imagine how far that extends into her lower jaw. All the way there and all the way up here. This is just massive reinforcement for giant thick teeth. So you can see a lot of things, uh, not only is her root twice as long as the tooth, but it's incredibly thick, it's wider than the tooth is. As we look edge on, the tooth we normally think of, of razor sharp teeth. This is very thick. And there's nothing really sharp about this tooth at all. In fact, the, uh, the serrations here, you can run your finger along, very smooth. Uh, now these have mostly been worn away. <laughs> there's, not, there's not really a sharp point, not much of a sharp edge. Now this would have serrations that have been worn away here, but they're the thickest serrations of any theropod dinosaur. These are all these carnivore, two-legged kind of dinosaurs. Um, very thick, so that's why we can easily identify the teeth, because they're more like a zipper. So if you ever catch a zipper on your sweater and it yeah. shreds a little bit, that's T-Rex's strategy. So what's with her big boxy skull? This giant top heavy thing on the side of this teeter-totter, right? Yeah, there must have been some big advantage. It's about accommodating massively powerful jaws. She could bite with over 10,000 pounds of force. That's like a big van or a bus landing on you. If we had that kind of strength, we would just snap off our teeth like they were China, probably under most dinosaurs would snap their jaw in half. So you have a big boxy skull like a vice to help uh, reduce uh, the chance of breaking her own face and very thick teeth to reduce the chance of her teeth from breaking off. Now she still did break off her teeth, so she gets new ones every two to three years. If you notice, uh, she was about 28 years old when she died, old girl. She's got little teeth still going in and some bigger ones that may be about ready to fall out. Now I mentioned she's 28 years old when she died. The key question is... How do you know that? How do you know she's 28 years old, right? Good question to ask any scientist. <laughs> so, go, feel free to do that. Call me on things. So if I take one of her bones, and I take a bandsaw to it, I cut it in half, I can actually count the growth rings, just like, like the rings of a tree, exactly. Now the rings that we can do that, she grows at different rates in winter and in summer. So the, the growth rings, and she never stops growing. She grows every year. So count the rings, 28. That's about as old as T-Rex got. Probably 30, 35 was at best. Uh, we've only found one other T-Rex that is older, which is 38 years old. Now, let's talk, this specimen is interesting. You can find a lot of diseases and injuries on Sue, even without having an expert eye. So did you guys find any, any injuries? The jaw. The jaw? Little holes here? Oh, you're cutting to the end. Those are my favorite. I'm going to end with oh, those. Okay. Did you find any others, though? Maybe like that head? Like, it up here? Done These are probably oh. post-mortem. They're probably pieces that are broken off during <laughs> fossilization. You know, rock goes through some things when it's under the ground for 67 million years. Wait, I have a question. Yeah, yeah. This kind of goes away from the subject, but no worries. how did you find a tooth in a different animal and know it was a tooth? Like, how did you, how does that make it's sense? It's really easy to, as I mentioned, the serrations. Yeah. You can identify the tooth as T-Rex because it's the widest serration. So, if I look at a microscope at different serrations of different dinosaur teeth, I might see that per centimeter that has 100 serrations or 10 serrations. Okay, so the T-Rex is a very consistent number. I don't know specifically what it is, yeah. but if you find that in the hadrosaur tail, count the serrations, well, that would definitely be the rest. Was it by the, like, the bones of Sue, or was it somewhere else? No, this is, this is a different okay. thing. It's just oh. learning about T-Rex in general. Oh, okay. so did you guys find any injuries? Oh, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Where were you looking? Uh, like, out, like, out. Oh, this here? Yeah, That's post-mortem. 
Those are pieces that are that are missing. Getting a lot of identified of maybe your tail. What, what do you see? But it's just like decayed. Like those, like ah, those very good. Fine. Oh. Most people don't find that. That's great. So yeah, the top of the vertebra looks like I dripped acid on them. Yeah. Right. I, I didn't do that. Uh, that's osteoporosis and arthritis. You don't normally think of a 20-year-old having arthritis, uh, but those are the joints that have largely been worn away with old age. Uh, what about some others? Do so you notice on the right side of her ribs? Just big bubbles of exactly. She had a massive impact, some trauma on her right side. Those are broken ribs. Now we know she didn't die from that injury. How do, how do we know she didn't die? And the heel. The heel, right. Because there's big bubbles of stuff. So if I break your arm and you don't get good medical care, it doesn't set properly, your bone will grow out to help stabilize that break. She didn't have very good doctors. They, they didn't get set properly, so that's what happened. Anything else? She got her left shin. Oh. It's this massive infection on her left leg. You also see a bit of that on her tail. It may be the same infection. It may have gotten into her bloodstream. So what about these holes in the jaw? What do you think those might be? That was an early idea, was they might be bite marks. And it's my, one of my favorite things about T-Rex. Turns out that 60% of T-Rex skulls that have been discovered, a majority, contain bite marks from other T-Rex. Can you imagine if we found a civilization of people where 60% of the human skulls have been bitten through the lower jaw by other people? How they interacted with each other, their skulls, yeah, that, that's striking, right? Sue, however, is in the minority. Those don't fit a uh, bite pattern of other T-Rex. And in fact, if you look at the bone on the inside of these holes, it's trying to regrow, but it's fighting something. It looks like it's probably a massive infection, uh, maybe a bacteria or a protist. And it's the one injury that might have killed her. She might have had such a badly swollen jaw that she couldn't feed or couldn't breathe, maybe. But she was old. She didn't necessarily need a reason to die. So, some other things about this specimen. You like to think we're coming to a museum, we're going to see everything perfectly in the right positioning. Uh, but since she opened here in 2000, we've learned a lot about T-Rex. There's a lot of problems with how she's been posed. A lot of problems. Uh, for one thing, her shoulder blades here should be touching. She could probably touch her little arms together. And speaking of her shoulder blades, the little bone in between her shoulder blades. About this bit. Do you guys know what that is? Clavicle? No, it, it would be our clavicle, but we know it by a different name that we don't have. And you know in a different animal. What are, what are the animals? A, wish, you know, a wishbone, exactly. Oh. T-Rex has a wishbone that we call a furculum. Uh, this is basically a giant chicken with the head of a crocodile. You want to learn about T-Rex? You learn about that one, yeah. So this furculum, when, when Sue had been found, we'd never found a T-Rex furculum before. Sue probably had one, but it's in so many bits and pieces, we couldn't put it back together. So this one's made up. We have actually since found a T-Rex furculum. And actually it's a lot more curved like a chicken wishbone. Uh, another thing, her, notice how beefy her chest is. So a little top heavy, she's got a little too much weight this way. Her ribs should probably be a little more streamlined, a little less weight in her, in her torso. Uh, so that would be a little bit of a different shape. But my favorite, uh, oh, she also is missing some gastralia. Uh, ribs in her belly, which are upstairs. Uh, we find these in crocodiles, they help support her girth, uh, help it be a muscle connection as well. My favorite has to do with her legs though, and her knees. You guys notice, what's the difference between her knees and our knees? Got a big difference. They're separated, right? Like, we, right? like ours is separated. Oh, yeah, the kneecap's fine. Yeah, she doesn't have a kneecap. We have kneecaps. Yeah, tell her, tell her kneecap all fine, yeah. Okay, good question. Why do we have kneecaps? What's the advantage of having a kneecap? Protection? Yeah. Not so much protection. You can bend or more range of movement. Oh, here's your head. Oh. Uh, when you squat down, when you bend your legs and you're trying to support your weight, your thigh muscles, your quads here, don't connect very well to your, to your shin bone. So they connect to your patella, uh, which then connects to your shin bone via your patella tendon. So the point is, it allows us to squat down and support our weight. If she doesn't have a kneecap, there's no way she could squat down this way without collapsing. Even if she had a kneecap, she's seven tons. It's a little hard to believe that she could support herself, right? So why is she put in this kind of squat down active pose? Biggest reason is because it looks really cool. She's in this big active element. That's a common thing in paleontology. We like to put things in aesthetically pleasing, exciting poses. The more generous reason is that she's found kind of distorted. She was found sitting on her own head, which twisted her pelvis. You notice her right knee is kind of impacting her ribs here. She had this odd angle. So that's the only way they can get the femur into the hips. Also, this is not her real skull. Her real skull is upstairs in 
the excuse we're supposed to give is that her real skull is too heavy to mount safely here, which is true, but the better reason is that her real skull looks like it's been hit in the side of the head with a wrecking ball. Because she was found sitting on her own head. It's, it's twisted the story, so this one's been fixed. So why was she found in that pose is very interesting. I mentioned she has a very powerful bite. She also has very powerful neck muscles in the sides of her neck. She can thrash prey, right, and hold them down. Well, after they die, those giant neck muscles decay and they shrink until eventually one of them snaps. So the left side snaps, snapped her right head under her hips. She was found sitting on it. Similarly, we find with birds, most of the time, their head gets snapped backwards. Now, why would their birds head get snapped backwards instead of on the side like, like they're flying or something? You were almost right. They're flying. What's the difference about birds flying with their neck muscles? They don't. They have to hold their head up. So their, their head naturally, right? So you have the muscles on the back of their neck are gonna be short and holding their head up. So that naturally their head curves back. Yeah, so we find a similar pose with bird and arm. Okay, a uh, couple things before I open up for questions. I keep referring to her as a she. Do we actually know that she was a female? Or? No, we don't know the sex of any dinosaurs. We are really bad at sexing dinosaurs. Uh, with, with us, we have a clear sexual dimorphism, meaning that there's differences between the sexes. Females have to squeeze babies out their hips. There's a lot of differences in the skeleton. These guys are laying eggs. There's not much of a difference between their pelvis. There may be what's called a grassel and robust form, meaning that one of the sexes might have been bigger, a robust form, the other smaller. The problem is, even if we identified a grassel and robust form, we don't know which is which. Right? Now, there's some recent research in the T-Rex that might shed some light. We found T-Rex medullary bone just a few years ago. Now, medullary bone is a special kind of bone marrow that is found in birds only when they're pregnant. It's a kind of bone marrow that prevents them from leaching too much calcium into the eggshell. They don't just lose all their bones then, right? And then they lose the medullary bone after they lay their eggs. So, it's pretty compelling, and if that's true, that T-Rex had medullary bone because she died while she was pregnant. So that individual would have been female, but it's really hard to extrapolate that. So they would have laid about 20, 40 eggs. Another interesting thing about laying eggs, uh, sauropod eggs are these big like ostrich sack eggs. Theropod eggs are long and skinny, and we know they lay two at a time. Now that's gotta be the thing where you call the scientist on, how, how do you know that they lay two eggs at a time? It's funny, that when you look at the eggs, they all have a flat side. So they squeeze two eggs out through the cloaca at the same time, they all have one flat side on them. That's the most funny thing you can do. So here's my favorite thing T-Rex that I've talked about. What is the deal with her puny little arms? This is the thing we're wondering, right? Why does she have such seemingly useless little arms? The early idea is that they're a vestigial thing. This is what we assume, that they're not used for anything. Her ancestors had bigger arms that were more useful, but out of disuse, there was an advantage to them being small. It's the key thing about evolution too. People mistakenly say, if you don't use it, you lose it. That's not the way natural selection works. There has to have been some advantage for them to be smaller. Maybe to save weight, because she's top heavy. Remember, the seventh time you got it? Or maybe they're an easy target for another T-Rex to rip off an arm. Maybe out of disuse. But there's a problem with the idea that she wasn't using them. That they're vestigial. If you model the musculature, if you look at the muscle attachments on the bone, it turns out she was ripped. She was very powerful. She had strong, tiny arms. That's what she could curl 300, 400 pounds. That doesn't make sense if she wasn't using them. So what did she use them for? Well, maybe she used them for lifting herself off the ground or moving around the ground. But look at her hands. Do those look like hands adapted to life on the ground? No, they're clearly claws for grasping prey. Well, some scientists thought maybe they're for mating, for tickling a mate. It's the kind of thing that you say when you have no other ideas. <laughs> right? You know, you just throw that in. Well, maybe it's this. Well, uh, we learned a little bit recently. We took the right on arm to Argonne Labs in the suburbs here. They have one of the best electron microscopes in the world. What they were looking for was tiny microfractures inside the bone. And the pattern of microfractures will tell you how she used them in her life. So if we do a lot of push-ups, I'll get one pattern. If we do a lot of hammering, I'll get a different pattern. And this work is underway, but preliminarily, they didn't find much of anything. No stress fractures. So she wasn't using it as an adult. So the mystery continues, right? Well, here's what's shedding some light on it. It turns out that juvenile T-Rexes had adult-sized arms. Ah, exactly. Thank you for the sound of that. <laughs> so, this is the biggest T-Rex ever discovered. Imagine her little arms on a T-Rex that's a few hundred pounds, up to maybe a ton, right? 
way more useful. Now they can grasp prey, they're much more useful, much more like a raptor would, would use for, for grasping hams, okay? Another interesting thing, so maybe that a very different lifestyle, different hunting strategy as juveniles versus adults. I mentioned they're born in hunches of eggs, 20 to 40. Maybe they hunted with their brothers and sisters. Makes sense? It's wildly speculative, but it's possible that we see this in nature. Then when they reach their teenage years, they go through an insane growth spurt. I mean insane. They grow up to 10 pounds a day at the peak size. Not eat 10 pounds a day, grow 10 pounds a day. Imagine how taxing that is on the body. How many calories they need to take in. How much stress that puts on the anatomy. Now their arms have stopped growing. Maybe to save weight, maybe it's just one fewer thing to have to grow and scale with the animal, right? But we think if you have this massive change in growth, you probably have a change in anatomy, change in lifestyle, and probably strong selective pressure to growing very fast. So if we look at other animals like that, what might cause them to grow very fast at that age? Maybe they eat their brothers and sisters. We see this among axolotls and some fish, that their brothers and sisters are an easy local food source, and you make sure the strongest survive. So you have very strong pressure to make sure you're the fastest one of your brothers and sisters. Almost to the point where you're growing too fast and you're hurting yourself, right? So this might make some sense. In fact, even tiger sharks will only give birth to one tiger shark at a time. But it doesn't start out that way. They eat their brothers and sisters in the womb. In the womb, you can see this on YouTube, uh, of a tiny little fetal tiger shark eating its brother and sister that wasn't growing quite as fast. Nature does not select for the prettiest, most elegant way of doing things only selects for what works. Nature isn't nice, it's not pretty. So when we want to learn about the way dinosaurs behave, we learn a lot from looking at organisms that are their size, their shape, uh, with that kind of lifestyle. So we look at baby uh, animals that have a lot of babies with a fast growth spurt, that might be something we can speculate about. If you guys have any questions, I could talk about T-Rex all day. Any questions? Anything? What do you got? You said this was found, uh, so it was found in Utah. South Dakota. South Dakota. Yeah. Ah, yeah. So he was a member of the Sioux. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, okay. he was, was resident, but he owned the private land. Right. Yeah. There was a lot of mix up of who has legal jurisdiction. Right. There's mineral mining rights on the federal government, and it was the Sioux Indian Reservation, which is right. run by the federal government, right? Plus private ownership rights, plus the person that discovered it. Turned out that the uh, they didn't get uh, permission from Maurice Williams very clearly. They had paid him, I think it was about $7,000 to look for dinosaurs on the land, but that wasn't officially for buying anything that they found. Right. Yeah. So Sue's discovery actually changed a lot about the way fossils were discovered and ownership because nothing was ever sold for anything like $8 million before. How long ago was that? So 1990. And it took a decade between discovery and her opening here at the Field Museum. Yeah. When they discovered her, was it? Was it isolated and alone, or were there others? Really good question. Yeah, I skipped that part. Yeah, so Sioux is found South Dakota. We normally think of that being a kind of deserted, boring uh, landscape. And during Sioux's time, that was oceanfront property. Uh, the Gulf of Mexico used to come all the way up to the central United States, up to like Wisconsin, Michigan, the Dakotas. So she was found alongside fish fossils, seaweed, as well as some of the uh, large dinosaurs that she would have been hunting. Uh, so like Triceratops, and chylosaurs and hadrosaur dinosaurs especially. Speaking of which, an interesting thing about what she would have been hunting. Sue was so well preserved, they were able to find her inner ear bone. Which, uh, so it's a stapes, about that big. You think of inner ear bones being little, but animals big. And we were able to recapitulate her sense of hearing because she was very well tuned to low pitch sounds, not so much high pitch sounds, so she probably couldn't hear a human scream very well. But what does that mean that she's tuned to low pitch sounds? Well, low pitch sounds are what herd animals tend to communicate with because low sounds travel over longer distances. Uh, elephants, whales, and hadrosaur dinosaurs. Hadrosaurs, uh, remember the Parasaurolophus with the big trombone on its head? One of the few dinosaurs we know how they would have sounded, producing these very low pitched kind of mm, bellowing sounds, right? Sue's ear was very well tuned to be able to track those animals. Now, Sue didn't roar, sorry to break you, uh, probably couldn't manage much more than a hiss or a low cut of a rumble uh, like a bird, but it has, it has no voice box. So it's probably not going to be able to support very sonorous sounds. Uh, what's, what's that? Jurassic Park. Is that yeah, Jurassic Park has a few problems with it. Uh, one common thing when people see Sue is they say, oh, it's smaller than I thought. Well, the, the Jurassic Park T-Rex is too big. 
Also, the, the elephant's here up on a pedestal, and this guy's a little bit lower. So it's a little deceiving. But when you flush her out, she's really an extraordinarily large animal. Any other questions? Do you think they fell down a lot? Like their balance was pretty off? Excellent question. This is one of the big debating points about was she actually tracking live animals? Because people would say, you know, if she was running and fell down, she would die. Yeah, that's probably true. It's seemingly the case with ostriches. They run fast, if they fall, they die. So don't fall, is yeah, the answer. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's one of the amazing things about T-Rex. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so we think about, she's a slow, she must be slow if she's this big. She actually, among all theropods, we, we study how fast they might be by looking at the length of their legs, which even considering how big they are, tells you how good of a runner they were. She scored one of the highest. Even though she had to hold up seven tons, she had very powerful legs, probably a pretty good, uh, can move at a pretty good clip. 10 miles an hour easily, maybe 15 to 20 max, which would have been faster than any of the dinosaurs she had to track down. Now she never ran. To run means that you actually have both feet off the ground, right? She would have been power walking at about 15 miles an hour. So to think of the posture, uh, you have their bent knees here, that's not true. So she would have had upright, standing on her tiptoes, flat, and she would have walked kind of like a bird. Pick up your foot and put it down straight. Okay? So there's your T-Rex, she's kind of a walking, right? And one of the things, you look at her weight distribution. She's a little top heavy, right? Got a lot of weight on this side. So she must have had a lot of girth on her tail to help balance her out. If she had a lightweight tail, her legs would have to be underneath her face. She'd have to stick her legs forward and she wouldn't be able to move very well that way. So she probably had maybe some fat deposits back there, but probably a very muscular tail. She might have used the muscles in her tail to help walk. Something we see with Komodo dragons, which is that they, you have uh, muscles from your tail to the back of your femur, so that as you take a step forward, your tail goes this way, and it helps propel your legs forward a bit. The, mo the, the kind of pendulum swing of your leg keeps the momentum going. Uh, the pendulum swing of your tail keeps the momentum in your legs. This is a long answer. A lot of stuff I got to skip. We'll get back to it. Ask about your background. What's that? Oh, yeah. So you said that you're a scientist at the University of Chicago. Yeah. What do you do? I'm a biochemist by training, uh, chemist by